Welcome to See You on the Other Side, where the world of the mysterious collides with the world of entertainment. A discussion of art, music, movies, spirituality, the weird, and self-discovery. And now, your hosts, musicians and entertainers who have their own weakness for the weird, Mike and Wendy from the band Sunspot. Hi everybody, it's Wendy. Before Mike gets into today's interview, I just had to jump on here and say, congratulations! After last night's blood moon, which was the fourth in the tetrad of lunar eclipses, the world is still here, it's still spinning, and in fact, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous fall day, so at least here in Madison, Wisconsin. So I just wanted to congratulate us all on missing yet another apocalypse I'm pretty excited about that. So glad we're still here, at least for another day and for another episode. So for today's episode, if you'd care to check out the links and things that Mike and the Gray Brothers talk about, you can find all of that good information at othersidepodcast.com slash 59. Enjoy the interview. And it's a special treat today uh, where I get to talk to both of the filmmakers involved with Gray Brothers Films. And that is Adam and Drew Gray. Adam and Drew, how are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? All right. Fantastic. Fant- it's, the, it's the first day of fall here, and October, I'm sorry, September is the best time to be in Wisconsin because it's not too cold, not too warm. It's like Goldilocks. It's just right. Yeah, it's just like that in, uh, here in Belleville, Ontario as well. It's just, just gorgeous. So uh, to fill in our listeners a little bit about what you guys do, so Gray Brothers Films, um, you guys have put together several documentaries about uh, supernatural and paranormal phenomenon. Um, You had a series called Supernatural Visitor. Uh, Investigator. Supernatural Investigator. Sorry, Supernatural Investigator. Yeah. And uh, a documentary called The Nightmare. Mm -hmm. Um, And we're going to get into details on both of those things. And then your latest is based on um, the Barefoot Bandit Fly Colt Fly. Yep, Fly Colt Fly, Legend of the Barefoot Bandit. That's a a feature documentary about Colton Harris Moore. That's that's currently playing on uh, HBO Canada and the Movie Network and Movie Central if, uh, if you're in Canada. We sort of uh, turned uh, turned to true crime for uh, for our next phase of filmmaking. <laughs> okay, well, hey, supernatural to true crime. I mean, that's not too far of the wheel. You know, I, I watched a lot of Fly Call Fly, and I remember when Colton Harris Moore was out there doing his escapades and hearing about it, and he had like a supernatural ability to get away from the police. Yeah, yeah. He, he sure did. I mean, when you think about... Uh, I don't know if people know this story, but, uh, you know, a teenage kid on the run with nothing, living in the woods, running in his bare feet, who taught himself how to fly and steal planes and uh, has got the FBI and Homeland Security chasing him. And uh, they couldn't get him. It took them two years before they uh, he was finally caught in the Bahamas. Yeah, it was really like following a non violent uh, supervillain. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good way to put him. That's a, and it's interesting. It's like a real life well, I guess Catch Me If You Can was a real life story. But this I mean, this is a character like Leonardo DiCaprio in Catch Me If You Can, I felt. Except this guy actually flew the planes. Right. <laughs> right. He didn't just play a pilot. He was a pilot. You bet. And in the film and first of all, if you if you guys can get your hands on the film, uh, watch it because it's for number one it's it's really fun. And number two, like, you guys have great graphics in it. I thought the animation was excellent. Oh, thanks. Uh, the quality is, is, it's just, it's a really interesting documentary on this guy, Colton Harris Moore, who was about uh, five and six years ago, he was just running around uh, the Northwest United States, get, stealing things, stealing planes, getting into trouble, ordering, like, stealing people's credit cards, ordering packages and, and stuff to go to their business to, of the people he stole from the credit cards, then breaking in and stealing the packages. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. That's how he got his, his flight instruction manuals, I think, doing that. Yeah. <laughs> how did you guys get interested in a character like Colton Harris Moore? Uh, well, we were... Uh, Billy the Kid? Yeah, it was through Billy the Kid. We were, uh, we were doing some research for a script about Billy the Kid and 
you know, some of the newspaper writers and stuff were compare, making these comparisons. So Google had us run into his story sort of early on. And we were just like, oh, my God, this is crazy. This teenagers, you know, stealing planes and they they can't catch him. And, uh, you know, he's become a folk hero. And it was just uh, it was too tasty to turn down. So we just we just went for it. Yeah, it was really a story that went into uh, that got to the uh, the myths and the uh the, the folk history that we've we've always liked, be it uh, gunfighters or superheroes or supernatural stuff. Yeah. So why do you think a character like a Colton Harris Moore became a folk hero? Because Billy the Kid, characters like that that would kind of was on the side of poor people. Now, if I remember about Billy the Kid, he was a Confederate after the war, right? Well, I don't think he, Billy the Kid wasn't involved in the Civil War. I okay. think he was, he was a bit young, but he... But he was involved in he was involved in a, a land sort of cattle dispute in in New Mexico. I mean, really, there's there's not the only similarity. He was a killer. He you know he right. killed quite a few people, and uh, you know rightly or wrongly. Um, but what what's similar about them is how their story took on a life of a life of its own. That you know they became folk heroes, the underdogs that, that people were, were rooting for and, and then their mythology becomes, you know, larger than, than the individual, you know, it becomes something that's part of our uh, collective consciousness, you know. Yeah. And, and like, uh, like Colton Harris Moore, um, the, uh, Billy the Kid, they, they were both um, sort of ran parallel lines in the uh, press. Obviously, Billy the Kid was uh, was a killer, and Colton was a, a crook. So there was obviously a lot of uh, negative press, right? But uh, but for others, uh, they could really live vicariously through his uh, adventures. For example, they're serialized. Yeah, yeah, they're serialized. Uh, every uh, every week, there's a new article about Colton Harris, you know, sticking it to the man, and uh, people in Washington State are. Specifically in the areas that mm-hmm. he was uh, burglarizing, they were of course not very happy. But uh, but outside of Washington State, um, people just enjoyed the stories. I think. Yeah, if you weren't the one whose house he was breaking into, or boat, or car, or plane he was stealing and crashing, you know, it sounded like a, an amazing story that people just uh, people wanted to see what was going to happen next. Well, absolutely, and and also the thing is, I think of most people aren't the kind of people that can afford a plane. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's like, who's he sticking it to? You said the man or super rich people that can afford gigantic, you know, air vehicles. And uh, I think I mixed up Billy the Kid with Jesse James there for a second. Sorry about that. Yeah, That's well, kind of... A, a lot of similarities. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the idea of running around and messing with the government and like you say the the folk hero idea and like colton harris moore didn't kill anybody like it's easy to root for people who aren't violent yeah yeah and and, and especially you know during that time too was sort of the was right around the you know the occupy movement and you know he's colton certainly fit in with the 99 percent you know who is you know stealing from a lot of rich people and, you know, he stole from poor people as well. But right. <laughs> Let's, I mean, the thing is, even though people sometimes tend to idolize some of these Robin Hood type characters, uh, Colton Harris Moore, is, in, his, in his heart, he was pretty much just a crook. Well, I, I think, you know, in his heart, he was, he was somebody that he didn't, he didn't stand much of a chance in life. Okay. You know, he was kind of, he had a horrible childhood and he was kind of sort of doomed to, being in uh you know in prison or working a low end job and he just sort of said you know screw it I'm um, I'm going on the run and he do he was just more or less trying to survive like he wasn't when he stole a plane he didn't you know sell it he just you know got somewhere else crashed it and okay. kept working. you know he wasn't making yeah. uh there's no treasure he's buried somewhere you know he he was caught with, you know, a few dimes in his pocket, I think. Yeah, it's easy to read that uh, he caused millions of dollars in property damage and stole <laughs> $500,000 boats and planes. But, uh, but yeah, he never, he never really collected, as it were. Yeah. What do you, what do you think his, his 
most outrageous stunt that you were like, okay, like I can't, I can't believe this. Well, that's sort of the end of the film, but uh, <laughs> oh. he did. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Kevin? Well, I, I think you know, for us, it was uh, we were already you know in the process of you know getting the funding together for the film and stuff, and we were in touch with the. Uh, you know, the, the different uh, television companies that were behind it and mm-hmm. stuff and, and selling it. And then, you know, he, uh, it, the whole story had taken place in Washington state. He'd been doing everything there sort of in the, in, in the area. And then all of a sudden he starts, he makes a break for it when they call in all these bounty hunters to go after him. And he steals a series of like 12 cars and drives all the way across <laughs> the United States and they're just sort of the news is just, you know, following these little dots where he was, a car was found here, another car was found here. And we're like, Oh my God, what's he going to do next? And then he steals a plane from uh, Bloomington, Indiana, and he flies it uh, to the Bahamas and crashes on, crashes it in a, in a mangrove swamp up there. And we were, you know, we were just like, Oh my God! Yeah, that's the way to go out big. I can't believe it. And then, and then he survived. He steals <laughs> another car in the Bahamas and starts breaking into places there to get food and stuff. And you know, the final day, he's in two separate boat chases. You know, like he's he steals a boat and gets chased by a bunch of you know vigilantes and then escapes and then steals another boat and is chased by the police. You know, it's it's James Bond craziness going on so it was the ending to us was just like wow it's just like we he's, he's writing it for us and, and and the reenactments are super fun in the film oh thanks that's i mean that's a, it's it really is a delight and you know i think about this when you guys talk about getting into true crime and in this particular film and you know when i said like well in his heart this guy's a crook and you're merely like well no he's a dude that it, it grew had a rough childhood and like and, <laughs> yeah. and, and and so you sympathize with this character yeah. at yeah, the, sure. at the same time this i mean it's not just millions of dollars of damage it's like do, how do you feel like he had a conscience about these things or was he that just he just didn't care about other people's property I think it's a bit tragic. I mean, he obviously uh, made some bad, de- some bad decisions, and those <laughs> bad decisions uh, he's paying for them. But he made a lot of those decisions before he was fifteen. You know, he's sure. was, he was on the run, and he went down uh, uh, the criminal path and uh, couldn't really get back out. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, if somebody if somebody escapes prison, you know, which which he did. He was on the run from uh, from like a juvenile facility, and you know what are your what are your options? Your options are to go back and turn yourself in, right? And you can't you can't just go get a job. So your option is to like feed yourself, hide, run, you know. And they call that and it gets called a crime spree. But you know, in a lot of ways, it's like it's the only way to survive. It's like you know. I can break into this cottage and steal some food to eat, but you know, I know that's wrong. Should I starve to death or should I, you know, you know, cause a little damage to this house and eat something, you know? I think it's also worth mentioning that this this is a big kid. This he was six foot five, over two hundred pounds, and he lived in a trailer about the size of your studio, Mike. Okay. <laughs> uh, he just had to get out. And all around him, I mean, there's there's a lot of wealth on Camino Island, where uh, where he grew up. It's not all wealthy, but there's a there's a lot of sort of um, there's a lot of rich people around, and I think it really got to him. Yeah, I can see that. And and plus, once you start, I mean, you're in for the penny, you're in for the pound. Yeah, I mean, and he was he was going for it, and I'm sure. Uh, yeah, I think part of it maybe was that. He was he was someone that had you know a lot of negativity in his life and people thought he was worthless and you know he wasn't going anywhere and then you know he starts doing this stuff it starts like as a a local legend the the local newspapers and stuff pick up the story of you know this uh, this burglar who's you know a little bit like Bigfoot you know there's like you know there's an odd sort of blurry picture of him and no one's sure whether he's right he's a big he's, dude. He's, 
he's real or he's not real. And he starts getting this press. And I think, you know, for him, it must have been some of the first uh, positive feedback in a way that, you know, for, for his ego that it's sure. like, oh, here's something I'm, I'm good at. Here's something that people are taking notice of. And, you know, I think the fame may have, uh, you know, fed it that he wanted to do something bigger and bigger to, uh, you know, until it was an international story. Well, and I think that that theme when you talk about the international story and you talk about like this is something he's good at and he starts hearing the stories in the news and, and other people start hearing stories about him. Um, that theme of you know, like folk heroes when you're talking about Billy the Kid you were researching when you discovered Colton Harris Moore and decided to make a movie about it. Those folk beliefs and the opinions of, you know, like groups or the common person or something like that, that seems to be a theme, what I found running through um, some of your work, Espe- <laughs> yeah. you know, especially in the nightmare. Mm-hmm. And um, so let's get started real quick. So uh, number one, everybody should watch Fly, Cole, Fly, because you're going you're gonna to have a good time. And it's a true life story that's, that's super interesting. And it's not paranormal, but it certainly is a quality story. And to go back to your first few documentaries, what made you interested in really getting into, um, you know, a, a field that's where, well, it's hard to prove anything, you know, like you said, <laughs> the, the supernatural investigator? Uh, well, The Nightmare was our, was our first documentary that, w- that was our own. We'd been working on a, a series about race cars called pit crews it was falling like uh, nascar pit crew through a race weekend kind of thing and you know it was a gun for hire kind of job sure and then i had this this came to you in the middle of the night yeah yeah it just it came to me in the night <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean this, it, you can laugh about it now but at the time that kind of stuff is terrifying it was horrifying uh you know i was i was scarred by it, it was, um should i should i explain what happened to me Absolutely. But let's get into it. So <laughs> what, So, everybody listening, the nightmare is about uh, sleep paralysis. And we've talked on this show a bunch of times about sleep paralysis because it's happened to me. I, after, oh, yeah? after I read Communion, I swear, <laughs> you know, we even we wrote a song called Hypnagogic and stuff like that. So we, I mean, <laughs> so sleep paralysis is something that we've used on the show and even for inspiration for music. Uh, for you know, for for a while now. So for everybody listening, so sleep paralysis. You wake up, you start seeing some weird things. Your your brain is still active in dreamland, uh, even when you feel like you're awake, and it's terrifying. You can't move. I saw aliens. Thought I was abducted. Scared the crap out of me. Really? Yeah. Like when I was thirteen. I'd like to hear your story. I just woke up in the middle of the night. And I saw all these little white faces around me. White, huh? Yeah, couldn't move. I didn't feel anything in my chest or anything, but I, I couldn't move. I had trouble breathing, just panicking when I saw that. And then after about 10 seconds, they disappeared, and then I could breathe and, <laughs> and scream, finally. Yeah. Uh, and let it all out. But that's... Um, Did they probe you? No, no. <laughs> I, and I, I double-checked on that, too. <laughs> And uh, I figured pretty, you know, pretty early on what it was because I read about it. And some, I, you know, I like looked it up in like a psychology book or something. Because I'm like, oh, did something really happen? I'm like, no, it looks like I was just kind of still dreaming while I was awake. Woke up, th- I saw those things around me. I had been reading Whitley Strieber's book a couple <laughs> weeks prior, and scared the crap out of me. Yeah, that's a scary book. Yeah, but is. I wonder. You know, the the question, in some ways, is okay. So you had that. You had this experience, and you know, it it feels completely real, right? Oh yeah. Like, and it's terrifying. And then you you go and you look it up, and someone in the medical profession categorizes it as a hallucination. Mm-hmm. And you know, what does that mean? What is what is what is hallucination? really mean i mean it's it's a word that describes an experience that one person has that that they're the only one that can that can see it someone else in the room wouldn't wouldn't see it right so does that that to me that doesn't necessarily mean it didn't happen you know 
you know, no, that's it true. Be, it could be, you know, if we're going, if we're allowed to go far out on this podcast, we're you know, we're always allowed to go far out. Like that's that's the point. It could be the perception of you know uh, another dimension or something like that. You know, it's, it's just we don't know. Why don't you describe your experience as it was uh, similar to others that we found around the planet? Oh, yeah, yeah. Le- le- I think. I think we want to hear about because this kicked <laughs> off. I mean, this kicked off your career for a little while. So I mean, that's yeah. So so I was lying lying in bed uh, asleep uh, with my wife, and um, I think it's the first thing I remember was feeling like something really soft touching my face, and uh, and feeling like puppy's fur or something. And I remember sort of that's what started to regain my consciousness and then okay. I realized oh yeah we don't you know we don't have any pets and uh and then I felt <clears throat> this sudden sense of of dread that there was something evil in the room and um and I I don't it's been a few years now. I don't remember the exact order of like when I realized I couldn't move, but I, I could sense that there was something there, and I managed to open my eyes. And standing at the foot of the bed was this sort of entity that was sh- wearing a shroud or like a cloak. Okay, and. and uh, when I saw it, the level of terror that that filled me is is indescribable. Like just sheer terror. And and, and so let's set the scene a little bit here. So what year is this? Two thousand seven, maybe. Okay. Yeah. So around two thousand seven. Do you guys live like in a subdivision? Is it an apartment building? Are you out in the I woods? Live, I live in a 140-year-old Victorian house in, uh, in a very old uh, area of, of Belleville, Ontario, called the, called the East Hill. So, you know, prime, prime area for, uh, <laughs> right, okay. for ghost stories. Okay, uh, that, that's a good start. And now when, when you see the entity in the shroud. Mm-hmm. Now you, you talked about having that feeling of, um, fur. Uh, is it what's in the shroud? I don't know. Uh, and I, and I, and it was just the, the feeling of fur was just some, it didn't, didn't seem to be connected, but that's just sort of the first thing I remember, like that was, that sort of made me wake up, you know, what that was, God knows. Sure. Uh, so then, uh, I, I try to scream and uh, too terrified, you know, it, it feels like you're too scared to move or too scared to scream. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like you're, you're paralyzed for some other reason and this is happening. It feels like you are paralyzed because you are so scared. Okay. And so I'm making these sort of like, you know, type, you know, pathetic, you know, scared Girl Scout. Yeah, no. The, the sounds. I was gonna say the sounds are one of my favorite parts of the movie too. And you make it like you're you're talking to somebody, and you're like, "Yeah, I was going like this," and like you see the person you're talking to just looking at you, like, "Okay, all right." So that's how it was. Okay, he was not like John Wayne. No. <laughs> and uh, so then this thing from under its under its shroud raises one hand, uh, what presumably is a hand. And uh, I could feel myself at that point being sucked out of my body, like like I could tell that my body was was still lying in bed, but I, whatever that is, was being pulled out of it, and uh, and I was resisting, and it was sort of like uh, you know I was in and out, in and out, like <laughs> of my body fighting it, and I remember. Th- the feeling that if I allow this thing to suck me out of my body, that that's it. I will be obliterated, you know, mm-hmm. but not exist anymore. And, uh, and at that point, my wife woke up and she thought I was having like a, a seizure or something. 
and she sort of shook me and and when she as soon as she touched me it disappeared just went poof, and uh i was you know back to normal and uh and I, and I was like, oh, my God, did you see that? Did you see that? Right. And she was like, see what? You're just you know, having a nightmare. So I go, go to back to sleep. And I was like, oh, my God. Right. There's no go back to sleep after you saw the entity at the foot of the bed. No. So then, so then I started Googling and, uh, and, you know, found that this was something that people were labeling sleep paralysis. And uh, the more I researched it, you know, obsessively, the more you realize that, okay, well, well, there isn't, you know, this isn't something that's known culturally where I live, but in, in Newfoundland, they call it the, the old hag and in Japan, they call it the Kanishibari. And there's all these different um, sort of folklore beliefs about this experience all over the world. So that was, that was sort of the beginning of, of, how we started making the movie was, well, let's travel around and talk to different people and different cultures and how they describe this very similar experience. And, and, you know, and I think, um, and when you go to document these different, so you go to um, Zanzibar Mm -hmm. in the movie, you go to Japan Mm -hmm. in the movie, um, Newfoundland, I mean, that's not too far, but I mean, like Japan and, and Zanzibar, like, I mean, you really take off to go to find this in various cultures of this phenomenon of sleep paralysis and then seeing something there. So you talk about like the folk beliefs of the area and you guys are very respectful of it in the, in the movie. So what was your, uh, I guess, um, the way you were approaching it? Like when you're like, okay, we're going to approach this as a, is it, is it an anthropological study? Is it a scientific uh, look at? Where were you guys kind of coming from? It was Shane versus Hufford on that regard, right? Yeah, well, I mean, we do have a bit of the, about a bit of the scientific explanation for it. But, I mean, the scientific explanation for it, at least at this point, is, uh, is, is theoretical. Like, there's no, it's not, it's not proof. It's like, well... You know they don't they don't really know why we dream why we sleep i mean the i think you know neuroscience is is in its infancy in a lot of ways so mm. i don't think they can they can definitive definitively explain what this is so we were going for you know what's what what are the similarities in the different cultures um and you know how how can it be that that we're if this is a hallucination, how can it be that someone in Africa is having the same hallucination as someone in a, in a little village in Newfoundland? You know, what, how's that possible? So um, for the listeners, now, I mean, it might sound like we're just talking about bad dreams and like, should there be this much, you know, you need, really need to make a movie about bad dreams. But um, yes, it's called Sudden Unexpected Death Syndrome. Yeah. And you have, uh, I mean, people who actually die in their sleep. It's, it's like that old, what was the movie, Dreamscape? Whenever they yeah. say if you die in your dreams, you die in real life. Yeah, it was actually a, the, the, uh, the suds, or the, you know, the, that syndrome is what I think inspired uh, the Nightmare on Elm Street series um Shelley Adler. where yeah where these these Hmong refugees um from uh, vietnam in the united states california start you know healthy young men just dying in their in their sleep and people who s- see this happening describe them as you know the same the same um way you would describe someone watching someone have a sleep paralysis experience where they look terrified and uh, and they it seems like their hearts just stop they may be literally scared to death and we have a large Hmong population in Wisconsin and Minnesota actually too oh yeah because one of the uh, the Fort, Fort McCoy up here was one of the places that they were resettled after the war 
and then they went um, to the nearby cities. Interesting. Yeah, so I used to do the news in a town that had like a Hmong cultural center and the whole community and stuff like that in a small town called La Crosse, Wisconsin. Huh. And so that's actually, that was the first time I ever even heard of the group, the ethnic group. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. Like, I just didn't expect to see a, a, a huge Southeast Asian population in La Crosse, Wisconsin, but there they were. I'm like, all right, that's great. And was this happening there as well? Um, you know, I think more of it happened in Minneapolis where a larger group resettled. Hmm. But I, I, so I, you know, this wasn't something that uh, had been talked about. In fact, it wasn't until my sister, uh, Adam, who I think uh, you've met online, mm-hmm. um, she uh, she was the one who who originally told me about it. She because she's like she was like sons. She's like it's real. Watch what happens when you sleep. You know, <laughs> <laughs> right? Don't close your eyes. And, uh, you know, that she you know, said it, that this was really something that happened in the Southeast Asian population. And in Thailand, it's set up to like 100 people died in this in like a course of 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe less than that. But, they, but in, their, in their belief, the Hmong belief was that this was the Dao Cho, which, which is the same thing as the hag. You know, it's just their, their, their name for it. Um, so, you know, whether, <laughs> who knows what, you know, why these guys were really dying, but that's what these people believed. And, and uh, the way they stopped it apparently was that um, once they came to the United States and they were out of, they, they weren't practicing, their communities were broken up and they weren't practicing their, their uh, religion. Um, and once they went back and started having their shaman and performing ceremonies and stuff and got back into their, their own culture that this apparently uh, stopped it. And I, in the film, I go through one of these, I don't know if exorcism is the right word, but... And was this, was this with a group in California or where did you yeah, guys go for that? Okay. California. And uh, what was really interesting to me was I went... I, I saw through making the film, I went through three different experiences with shaman or witch doctors who would who would attempt to uh, cure me of this experience. And um, and both the shaman in California from the Hmong and a witch doctor in a little island in Africa both tied a red string around my right wrist. As uh, and then put some sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, spell on this, on this bracelet that would protect me from these entities. And I was just like, how is it that that two such vastly different cultures on the other sides of the planet come up with the same cure for this? Like it's bizarre. Yeah. That no, and that is really interesting, and that's a great. I mean, that the scene when you go th- with the Hmong ceremony is really interesting. Then they show parts of the religion. They bleed the chicken on the New Year and stuff like that. It's just something. It's you know very different for yeah. you know, people from uh, the cultures that I'm used to. But you know, when you went to Zanzibar, mm-hmm. it kind of looked scary. Yeah. It was scary. <laughs> um, when, when they talk, well, you know, when they talk about the possession and stuff, and, and when the shaman went through the possession things, you know, when you guys were working in the documents, was at any point like, okay, like this is a little too weird or? Yeah, the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what, what's really interesting about Zanzibar and why we went there is that we found this, um, a guy named Martin Walsh, who um, is an anthropologist uh, from Cambridge University who was who was in Zanzibar and uh, was doing a study and they call it the Popabawa there and that's their Daocho and that's their hag that's their hag and and what was really interesting was that there it spread across the island like a epidemic like there was hundreds of people having this experience at the same time, entire villages, to the point where the you know the equivalent of their their president had to come out, you know, on on their local television and tell people not to panic, to read the Quran, to you know do whatever, because people were just out in the streets, um, afraid to sleep alone. There are people sleeping outside in large groups. 
um, to protect and, themselves. And this was in the 1990s, right? Like, this is not even, this isn't 100 years ago. Well, it happened in 95, and then it happened in 2007, just before we arrived. And oh, both, man. And in both cases, um, people had actually been killed because they believed that, you know, the, the people that these mobs killed were, they thought they were sort of like... Um, uh, witches that were behind releasing these spirits on on people, and then that was another common theme all over the place was that you know that witches were somehow involved in it that this was was the result of witchcraft. I thought that the uh, the professor that was there, he's gr- I mean he's great too. Like he just yeah. looks uh, like that guy that's been out in the outpost for ten yeah. years, and then the university just like forgot about him. <laughs> He's like, yeah, mixed between Wade Davis and Colonel Kurtz. <laughs> Good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, he's great. And, and a complete skeptic. Right. And, and, and that's the thing, because it's very easy, I mean, probably when you're in these places, to get kind of wrapped up in things. Like we talked, you know, we, we talk about folk belief and, and stuff, and the um, group think, or the, you know, the feeling of the mob and to keep your scientific or at least uh, objective perspective when you're in these situations and you see somebody, you know, f- going through a, a possession thing that's freaking out and you're taping it. it you know, I, I, I see how these, these ghost shows are made on uh, like the sci-fi channel and stuff. Yeah. And, and in his sci-fi and history channel, they've got a script and they've had people we've had on the show on their shows. And I always ask the people like, well, how did that go? And they're like, well, you kind of have the script that you stick to and the stories that you stick to and you can't, it's not really a a process of discovery. (laughs) And, and so when you guys are working on your documentaries uh, and especially when you're in a, you know, a situation where, okay, we're out here uh, with, you know, we're out here on on Zanzibar and some weird stuff is going on. How much is discovery? How much have you guys planned out in advance? Um, well, we we knew who we knew who to talk to. We, yeah, we knew who we wanted to talk to. Like Zanzibar, for example, we had this this professor that we're talking about, Martin Walsh, who had written a paper about his experience in this epidemic in '95. So we contacted him and said, "Hey, would you be interested in going back and talking to the different people that were involved in this?" Um, so that that's sort of like the level of our planning like we're going to talk to we're going to go there and we're going to try and talk to people who had it this experience happen to them and you know other people involved we'll talk to some witch doctors and 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 that sort of thing but you know other than that is there's no well, script. I think we owed it to the uh to the subject and I'd say the same with other projects we've done is is that there's uh um even though these these subjects are uh, are very difficult to uh, to rationalize with mm-hmm. our brains is there are very brilliant men who have dedicated their uh, men and women who have dedicated their entire professions to these subjects, and so we really tried to get um, some of the leading experts on uh, on tape. Uh, yeah, doc, Dr. Hufford mm-hmm. uh, in Pennsylvania, Alan Shane, and Alan Shane in uh, Waterloo. Mm-hmm. And uh, and we had very Shelley Adler, Shelley Adler, who who uh, who was the the leading uh, researcher on the sudden unexplained nocturnal death syndrome, <laughs> <laughs> and and we had extensive interviews uh, with these people as well as going through uh, their work. So we really uh, tried to represent the the current thoughts. I mean, it's uh, with with the um, sleep paralysis, it's either cultural or spiritual. And uh, and and we just tried to sort of explore it without definitively coming down on either side. Yeah. Also, th- there is something in the nightmare that talks about the group and and cultural versus spiritual. Like uh, I know that they talk about the placebo effect, the nocebo effect. You mm-hmm. know. Yeah. In in the movie, the idea that you know you're not practicing religion, you're not protecting yourself. Like that's what's happening is like now you are opening yourself up. 
to these kind of things and just just the thinking of it just the, the the power of belief of it can can cause your heart to stop when you're scared to death and literally scared to death in the middle of the night yeah and that was interesting but the most interesting was the part where you guys talked about a group hallucination in in the nightmare yes yeah there well, there's a number of times where i've probably heard a dozen stories where more than one person saw saw the entity at the same time. Uh, David Hufford, who wrote a great book about it, talks about that. And, uh, and in Zanzibar, there was certainly a number of people who, you know, it was a, a very disturbing scene where we're interviewing this woman in a little grass hut and with uh, Martin, and, and she describes being uh, sodomized by this. Oh, yeah by this creature and her whole family was in the room and they all saw it as well. And, and there's, you know, if you're to believe what these people are saying, and I don't have a reason not to believe them is, uh, that there's, you know, they're physically damaged from, from the experience. Uh, well, and the feeling of post-traumatic stress disorder you guys talk about mm -hmm. that, that the people who go through these things, I mean, they have the same, Brain, I mean, the same brain effects as people that have gone through things in wars and stuff. Yeah. Like, I, lit I literally, I say it in the film, people probably think I'm just being dramatic, but I literally slept with the light on for two years after it happened to me. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, yeah. And, uh, and, and the nightmare, I mean, I think, number one, it's, it's, it's one of the only things that goes into this whole sleep paralysis thing into depth and the detail that you guys do. And that makes it enjoyable uh, just from the fact that nobody else has done as much on it. I mean, people have talked about um, when they talk about alien abduction stories, mm -hmm. I mean, they'll go into the idea of the incubus and the succubus and, and things like that a little bit for like a little snippet. But then they always move on to the alien abduction part. You know, nobody gets to like, OK, there's something going on that's killed all these poor Thai and Hmong guys. Yeah. And, um, you know, is it just, is it whatever is happening, whatever they're not doing, whether it's religious or belief or placebo effect or not, um, we got to be doing something to help these guys who are dying in the middle of the night because none of us wants yeah. it to have to, you know. So yeah. I think the nightmare is a great way to look, you know, for inter introduce people to sleep paralysis. Like if it's happened to you, watch that movie on Amazon Prime because it'll help you explain some things if you've had and you know like i've had uh you wake up in the middle of the night scared to death i would have loved to see it when i was 13 let's say <laughs> oh god um, yeah right? i won't let my kids watch it <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a good thing but it would, it would have saved me a couple more sleepless nights if i'd have known you know that okay this is something that's happened all over the world it's crazy i mean it might have made me not sleep because of the whole people dying thing <laughs> like <laughs> oh no yeah it's just a dream. It's not just a dream. People are dying. But um, <laughs> so, okay. But now, but you moved on after that into, you did an episode about UFOs. You did an episode about remote viewing. Has the supernatural or the paranormal been a lifelong interest for you guys? Well, it really kicked into gear when uh, the demonic entity started uh, harassing Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, we, it's always been in the back of our minds sure. until there was a dude at the foot of my bed. <laughs> it was, you know, it was like, you know, we're filmmakers first. Mm -hmm. And and it, it, the supernatural was a topic that we were uh, really interested in for about, I guess, three or four years. And I'm still interested in it, you know, but it's but we wanted to, you know, mix up and do some films about other things. But, you know, you, when you have an experience like that or some other um, supernatural experience, then you stop thinking of all these people as crazy and you start looking for explanations, you know. And I think that's what led us into doing these other documentaries of, you know, other people's experiences and, uh, you know, looking for – and it's just so – it's just so interesting. I mean, uh, well, and, and when you interview people, you know, like when you interview Ed Dames <laughs> in the remote viewing thing. Now, I hear Ed Dames on Coast to Coast, and I always think he's entertaining. Yeah. Uh -huh. But he sounds like he's 
out of this world. You know, like when he's talking about, <laughs> it just, he sounds crazy. Yeah. And n- number one, you made him sound totally not crazy. Like in the way that George Norrie or Art Bell never could. Make, <laughs> you know, make him sound like, oh, this dude, he's fine. Like, he's not yeah. saying anything wild. Um you make him sound, you know, perfectly sane in, in your episode of, of uh, The Supernatural Investigator. Yeah. And you actually go to the remote viewing boot camp or whatever that we always hear about or you see advertised and you're like, yeah. okay, there's no way I can afford this. Like, but going to Las Vegas for the <laughs> week might be pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, num- number one, uh, let's talk a little about the experience and what you got from it. Number two, did you use any of your supernatural powers to win money in Vegas? we didn't have time for gambling unfortunately (laughs) okay but yeah we put um a guy named jeff warren who's uh who's a science writer and his specialization is in uh is in consciousness and different things so we thought he, he was a smart young guy and so we actually put him through two different uh remote viewing boot camps as well as some other things and talk to some top people, but I don't know. What did you, what did you think of the boot camp? Stream? The boot camp per se. Well, I mean, it's uh, it's too easy to uh, to just go in there and grab the best comedy. Right. Uh, there there certainly was some of that, but these are these are people who uh, who really commit to the uh, to the technique of remote viewing, and we wanted to give it an honest shot. And uh, I mean, are we skeptical? Sure. But they, uh, they're really uh, trying to get at something, and they, they had some positive uh, results, and, and it is something worth looking at. Well, there's a verifiable hit in yeah. there. Like you see that, you're like, okay, there's, a, there's definitely a hit where he tries to view, you know, he tries to figure out what the image is, and then he like, nails it. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it seems so. But the uh, the brain works in, in mysterious ways, and it, it, it would seem that Jeff got the impression of what the instructor was was talking about and that's not quite the same thing as as a dead-on hit that's going to uh you know incontrovertibly pr- right. pr- prove anything but uh, but i mean it was the the in the film it's they have to try and figure out what is in the envelope there's a picture in the envelope and they have to, all the people doing the, the course have to try and remote view of what the picture is. The picture was a dolphin swimming through the water. And Jeff drew a picture of a fish swimming through water. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's pretty conclusive. <laughs> um, and, okay, and I apologize, I haven't explained to the listeners, remote viewing is sure. just seeing, I mean, it's... It's seeing something a thousand, you know, a thousand miles away. It's like you close your eyes and you can see what's happening across the street. It's, it's the idea of being psychic in that in in that way of, uh, and 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 they have a whole boot camp in Las Vegas where they go through, and they try to use these techniques to help you learn how to do it for yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a, a scientific approach to clairvoyance. Uh, like they they have a protocol and and ways of doing things that were developed and the um, been funded by the American military um, during the Cold War and all these guys like Ed Dames or Lynn Buchanan they were all you know government employees at one time that were uh, that were studying this stuff and trying to uh, spy on the Russians and uh, and now you can you can pay. You know, twelve hundred bucks for the weekend, and <laughs> and try to do it yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah. It really is interesting, and and that's, I mean, the men that you guys talk about, the men that stare at goats, mm-hmm. um, in the the movie with George Clooney and Bill Murray, where they they talk about some of the clairvoyance, remote viewing, mind powers program that the that the government tried during the Cold War, and. Um, I thought that uh, it, it's a it's a really nice balanced view. It kind of shows what the boot camp goes through. Uh, like I said, Ed Dames comes off comes off sound insane, which is great. Uh, <laughs> who comes off really well is Dean Radin. I yeah, think. Yeah, he's a he's a he's a brilliant guy, and he's written some really interesting books. And, uh, 
Yeah, he's a, he's a serious scientist. He always gets dismissed, I feel, just on the basis of the anti, well, the anti-supernatural bias in science, which I don't know is a, is a redundant phrase, um, <laughs> but it's, it, it's the anti, uh, you know, the anti-psychic feeling that I mean, most scientists don't even give it the time of day anymore. Yeah. I, I think Dean, Dean Radin tends to, um, he doesn't say crazy stuff, or mm-hmm. when he does... He uh, he contextualizes it for those who don't have who don't do this for a living. He says they are finding these uh, these studies which prove, for example, uh, three seconds of uh, precognition in certain experiments. Uh, but he's he's the first to point out that without tens of thousands of examples of such uh, results, it's not uh, technically. Um, significant in a scientific sense. So there's a lot of work still to be done. And uh, Dean is, is pretty level-headed with that reality. And it seems like that's something like we could do with apps or something like that to kind of to, <laughs> yeah. to get those hundreds of thousands of people you need. Because that makes me think about in college, in my experimental psychology class, I did a, you know, the thing where you put the ping pong balls over the eyes and uh, the, the Gonsfeld procedure. I did that with like the, guy, the people on my dorm floor. To try to send each other psychic, like send each other pictures, yeah, and then seeing if people could pick it out afterwards. Did it work? Uh, I, you know, using manipulating statistics, I proved that ESP exists. <laughs> nice. Um, right. But if a, a sample size of thirty people, I don't know, was quite enough to prove it to the scientific community. But it yeah. certainly was fun. Yeah, and and I think like that's was the problem with remote viewing as uh, as something for the military. Was that they they proved statistically that what they were doing was was better than random chance, like there was a there was a real effect. So maybe a good remote viewer is getting getting it right two out of ten times. And they'd be like, wow, you know, like he described you know this base in Russia perfectly. There's no way he could have known. You just got to beat but, chance. But yeah, but then he also gave you know six other that were completely wrong so as a, as a military application it's how do you how, how do you know what's right and what's wrong and i think that's why it was it was discontinued right you don't want to pick the bombing coordinates on the strength of the remote viewer <laughs> right. <laughs> who now works in las vegas <laughs> right <laughs> now you guys did a couple more episodes too of like talked about crystal skulls mm-hmm and that looked interesting. And then, uh, um, you know, when when I look you guys up, when you when I Google you, um, one of the don't fir- ever Google me. <laughs> one of the first things that comes up is the UFO caught on film in Canadian Brothers documentary. Yeah, that was awesome. And so, <laughs> when you're we're talking about the sense of discovery when it comes to documenting these things and and the theory of filmmaking and and stuff versus. Um, having a scripted show, knowing exactly what everybody's going to say and, and kind of determining the outcome before it happens. So why don't you tell us a little bit kind of Might what happened. more impressive if we had scripted that. <laughs> right, I was going to say, like, you know, I didn't think that the, you know, the Canadian documentary budgets were so high, but you guys really <laughs> brought up the production value on that one. We hired some aliens. <laughs> so yeah. uh, tell us a little bit about what happened there. Okay, well, the, the film is called, uh, which is available on Amazon, Amazon and iTunes and all that stuff, uh, The White Mountain Abduction. It's about the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case, one of the first um, people to come, come forward and, and admit publicly that they were abducted. But, the, you know, it's, it's one of our favorite documentaries we've done. It's really, you know, it's following Kathleen Martin and Stanton Friedman you know, sort of investigating, you know, what happened. Uh, Kathleen is the niece of uh, Betty. And anyway, so. And Stan, we, Stan Freeman's a ufologist. You'll yeah. have seen on every yeah. UFO television show um, out there. So you'd recognize him. He's got a gray beard, always wears glasses and a very distinctive voice. So just. He's a nuclear physicist. Yes. And, and, got, and a, a dude who loves UFOs. Yeah. And so I'll just just to get right to the to filming the UFO story. So we we go back to the White Mountains, 
to the location, the approximate location of where this abduction occurred um, with Stanton Friedman and uh, Kathleen Martin. And we're at the abduction site within a couple of days of the actual, you know, anniversary of the abduction. Okay. This, this sounds unbelievable, but there's footage there and you can, you can tell, tell it's, it's authentic. Um, and this is in New Hampshire. New Hampshire in the White Mountains, um, and we're we're interviewing them, and at night, and then all of a sudden there's this bright light in the sky, uh, in the background, and and then it disappears, and then another one appears, and then disappears, and then another one appears and disappears, and it it's just this bizarre <laughs> triangle forming uh, formation. Yeah. Like, the, like the one light would go out and that would be sort of the top of the triangle and then the next light would come and that would be the side of the triangle and then the next light would come and that would be the other side of the triangle. Yeah, and, uh, and our, luckily our, uh, our cameraman did not panic and, uh, and managed to get the shot without, you know, screwing up like so many people do when they're filming lights in the sky. He managed to keep you know, Kathleen and Stanton in the frame while you see these lights in the background. And, uh, I mean, it was just to see someone like Stanton Friedman seeing a UFO <laughs> and filming a guy who's been, after, after who's spent his career, you know, right. It's very, it's a, it's, it's a, a meta here, moment here. It's happening. And, uh, <laughs> it, it was, it was pretty cool. And so part of the film is us taking this footage around uh, to different people. We showed it to some people, a guy from the Air Force who's like, I have no idea what the hell that is. And uh, showing it to, uh, to other people in the area that had seen something sim very similar. And uh, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, bizarrely enough, it was, it was just about, I guess it would have been about the 48th uh, anniversary yeah. of the event. I guess. Okay, and, and you guys were there. Yeah. yeah. And they, they and they came back. Did you know missing time though, right? No, I don't believe so. <laughs> as far as we know. <laughs> we talked about Betty and Barney Hill in a previous episode and we talked about uh, hypnotic regression. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you listen to their like hypnotic regression tapes, it's terrifying. It sure is. Yeah. yeah. It's it's like it's listen it's like listening to someone being tortured. Yeah. Uh, and uh, now they're gonna make a movie of it too, that they just yeah, I saw that. It just yeah. came out like last week was news that they were going to make a movie about it. So, but you guys were there and saw the real UFO, and and we'll put <laughs> we'll we'll put a link to that uh, the video teaser, okay? That they talk about that in the show notes. And we'll put a link to all the all the stuff that people can view on the web for you guys. And uh, okay, Crystal Skulls. Now, just one last thing. You guys did a whole thing on Crystal Skulls. Um, BS or what did you guys think about them? Uh. Well, we went down there. We went to Belize and to uh, Mexico. That sounds like a tough vacation. I hope you got to go in winter. <laughs> it was. <laughs> you, we were in the jungle. It was no. It was no cakewalk. Oh sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and as I recall, I had a terrible head cold. But we went with uh, with an archaeologist who's very serious, and we just sort of got him to look into this. And we went to the Luban Tune in Belize, where the Mitchell Hedges skull was found, and interviewed the Mayan people there, and interviewed some um, uh, the Lacondon Mayan who are sort of like uh, you know sort of an un relatively undisturbed Mayan. Mm -hmm. uh, group that had not had contact with anybody from the outside until like the 70s. And um, yeah, I think, I think what, what we found was that there's a lot of strong evidence to say that the Mayans were using crystal skulls in, in ceremonies, you know, more than 500 years ago. You know, what does that conclude? You know, I don't know. I, I would, I would uh, venture that all crystal skulls, like psychic phenomena, like aliens, like the uh, possibility of uh, a physical demonic presence visiting you at night, um, there, it's all about belief. And um, certainly with the uh, Barney and Betty Hill is, is 
you have to at least conclude that the people we're speaking with, the people affected, truly believe what has happened. That they're not, that nobody's trying to like hoodwink you on something. I mean, exactly. whatever happened, happened, but what they believe, I mean, they're telling you something that they believe. These are people that were truly affected. Yeah, but crystal skulls. I don't, there, there's obviously a lot of a lot of uh, for, fakes and forgery. And, yeah, and people and, say crazy oh, things about them too. Yeah, but you know the the Mitchell Hedges skull. Are you familiar with? I mean, that's like the most famous crystal skull. Yes. Yeah, it, we got to you know see and touch, and uh, and it, it's it's very very cool. You know whether whether it was actually really found in in the Mayan ruins in uh, Belize, uh, I don't know. We talked to some to um, some really really old Mayan people in little huts who uh, who were around during the time of the excavation, and they they believed that that's where it was found, and that they had heard that story from uh, so. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of debate about that, though. I, yeah. Right. And can belief alone uh, make it real? Right. You know, if you believe you're being haunted by a demonic presence, be it uh, cultural or spiritual, uh, you know, you're experiencing it. And if you think you can get some psychic powers from crystal, perhaps you can. Well, and uh, I saw a crystal skull at the British Museum, and I had to take a picture, too. That was a delight in my life. But when you talk about the belief, and I I find that, too, because I'll do haunted history research around this area, and I've been putting together tours and stuff. You know, people believe these things happen. You know, did they see a ghost? Well, I don't really know if they saw a ghost, but they know that they were in the basement. Somebody grabbed their hair and said something to them, and there was no one in the room. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, and they're not, like, what does it get them to lie to me? Yeah. Yeah, I believe, yeah, I mean, people are having experiences that they, they, they can't explain. Absolutely. And, and I mean, and it's real. You know, it's a real experience. What, what's causing it, we, you know, we, we don't know. But, <laughs> but these, people, these people aren't just all watching the same television show. Like these locations couldn't be more remote. Exactly. When you talk about things happening from all over the world, and especially when, you know, up Zanzibar to Newfoundland to Thailand, like, you know, yeah. things like that, that's, that's completely, uh, there's no way that languages aren't even going to uh, be able to talk to each other. No, yeah. they didn't have running water in some of these villages. It was crazy. So when you guys did, did your documentary stuff, um, what kind of direction did you get from the is it the vision network or uh yeah those were all done for uh for vision which is a canadian television station and what kind of direction did they give you in the way of i mean obviously they want something entertaining that people want to watch but did they give you anything saying like okay at the end of this you better convince me that ufos are real or uh were they just like hey you guys do a good job go out and make the most entertaining documentary you can uh yeah no they had there were, there was no agenda in that they wanted um documentaries to be um skeptical and healthy you know uh and we were like we were one of several um film companies that were working on on this series we had our own episodes and they had their own episodes and some came out that you know this is whatever phenomena is co- complete baloney and you know ours were more the other way but okay. <laughs> but we looked for topics that we thought were relatively intriguing that there was you know some real people to uh to talk to about it and not just um uh, you know looney tunes yeah we're not really interested in doing subjects that uh that we believe are phony you know right from the outset you know, right it has to be a bit of a journey for us as well yeah so what is the next thing you guys are working on? Uh, we're, right now we're finishing up um, a documentary about uh, a Canadian outlaw uh, bank robber escape artist named Ty Khan, who's from our hometown. And it's, it's, uh, it's along the same sort of style as Fly Cold Fly, that it has a lot of animation and stuff like that. And um, we're working on uh, some, some true crime stuff. Stuff that we, uh, we 
I don't think we can we can go public with just yet. Understood. But you know, we really spent, we've clocked a lot of hours in on Zodiac and uh, <laughs> yeah. and and some stuff like that. Are there any paranormal themes that if you if you guys return to it or you had a, a company like Vision say like, hey, we'd like to make a, a few more uh, for us? Anything that uh, you wouldn't mind uh, investigating again? I I would I'm interested in in the connection between sleep paralysis and alien abduction, <clears throat> and I I would like to take people who have had sleep paralysis experience and do a hypnotic, hypnotic regression with them. And uh, I think that would be yeah, they, interesting. They mm. are vast, vast topics and, uh, and you really sort of, um, there's, the setup is very long. So after, after uh, building on uh, some of the other projects we've done, it would be nice to go deeper. Yeah, because I've always found like when someone talks about, you know, like, oh, well, it wasn't an alien abduction. It was just sleep paralysis. I'm like, well, well what that's is that? not an explanation. Oh, right. Yeah. Like, well, what does that mean? You know, and maybe there is a connection between the two things. You know, maybe, you know, it, it would be interesting to go deeper. Well, whatever you guys make, I would totally watch it because I, I enjoyed your stuff. And if you guys, if the listeners, if you liked shows that are a little bit less uh, histrionic, maybe, than the kind of stuff you get on the Sci-Fi channel uh, and something a little more, you know, your stuff reminded me of Arthur C. Clarke's World of Strange Powers. Which oh, was, thank you. Which was <laughs> always my favorite supernatural show because it, it, there was nothing, there was no crazy claims. And it was just interviews and discussion and then also a little bit of uh, going in there and doing some personal investigation. Cool. Well, thanks. And so that's I uh, really enjoyed it. So uh, we'll have links in the show notes to the, anything you guys have online. And we'll be looking out for more from the Gray Brothers. So b- but make sure you guys at home check out some of their stuff. You're really going to enjoy it. And I just wanted to thank you guys for uh, spending some time to give us a little bit of your perspective on documenting the paranormal. Our yeah, pleasure. pleasure. And, and it's a great show you've got there. It's thank smart. you. I like it. Thank yeah. you. All right. Well, you guys have an awesome fall, and I hope that we can talk to you again sometime. You bet. Sounds good. Thanks so much, man. Thanks, Mike. Our song this week is inspired by the Gray Brothers documentary on remote viewing for the show Supernatural Investigator. This track is called Tragedy of a Remote Viewer with a Broken Heart. <laughs> I burned your pictures, I burned your clothes I burned every little message and every little note Deleted emails, deleted text I let the cat rip up your side of the bed But every time I close my eyes
Thank you for listening to today's episode. You can find us online at othersidepodcast.com. Until next time, see you on the other side. Did they probe you?